The Spiritual World of Isaac the Syrian by Hilarion Alfeyev. Among the characteristic traits of St. Isaac the Syrian's asceticism, we begin with his understanding of the ascetical life as one lived in solitude, far from the world and the passions. We shall explore his teachings on the renunciation of the world required of a Christian when he enters the ascetic way. On the love of God and neighbor, on stillness as one of the main conditions for achieving peace of the mind. While we will emphasize various aspects of monastic and solitary life, we shall also touch on some of Isaac's more general ideas concerning Christian life, in particular his teachings on the fulfillment of God's commandments and the struggle against the passions. This survey should allow us to see Isaac's individuality as an ascetic writer and to appreciate the originality of his approach to some key themes of Christian asceticism. 1. Solitary and Renunciation of the World the hero in Isaac's writings is the Ichidaya, the solitary or literally single one. In Isaac's day, this term related to Hebrew Yachid, single, was used to designate a solitary monk as opposed to a cenobitic monk. The initial meaning of the term, however, points much more broadly to the unity of a human person within himself and to his unity with God. Thus, in the Peshitta, the term Ichidaya was used as a title for Adam as created after the image of one God. It was wisdom which preserved the ancestral father, the Ichidaya, who had been created in the world. In the New Testament, Ichidaya is first of all the epithet of Jesus Christ, translating Greek monarchenes, the only begotten. In Syriac writings of the 4th century, the term was already being used to refer to ascetics, those who are like angels in that they do not marry. A solitary is someone who lives in Christ, the only begotten, Ichidaya, from the Father who gives joy to all solitaries. Solitary is not for Isaac a synonym for celibacy and the eremitical life. It is first and foremost an experience of union with God. Most people find loneliness burdensome taking it as a fully negative experience of isolation, abandonment, the absence of the other with whom they might share the joys and sufferings of earthly existence. For Isaac, on the contrary, loneliness is an experience of the presence of God who is closer to him than any friend and who always cares for him. God has never perceivably shown his actions except in a region of stillness, in the desert and in places bereft of chance encounters with men and of the turbulence of their habitations. If someone lives in the desert, far from people, one should be sure that there is with him a guardian who will never leave him alone. The soul of the person who is separated from the world and leads the life of stillness is lifted up towards God. Astonished, it is struck with wonder and remains with God. Solitude is the internal experience of living within oneself, of withdrawal into one's inner person, a necessary action for uniting oneself with God. At the same time, it is the experience of renouncing the other, even a friend or a relative. It is finally an experience of withdrawal from the world and renunciation of it for the purpose of achieving union with God. Solitude can be painful, fraught with inner sufferings, but without the experience of solitude, one can never come close to the fullness of life in God. Thus, according to Isaac, renunciation of the world for the sake of a solitary life in God is a necessary condition for entering upon the way to God. Liberation from the material things precedes the bond of God. Again, no one can draw nigh to God, save the man who has separated himself from the world. But I can call separation not the departure from the body, but departure from the world's affairs. The world in this context is a collective noun which is applied to the so-called passions. To go out of the world and to die to the world means to liberate oneself from passions and the mind of the flesh, that is, from everything bodily and material which puts obstacles in the way of the spiritual life. Love of the world is incompatible with love of God. One needs to liberate oneself from the first in order to acquire the second. The soul that loves God finds rest only in God. First detach yourself from all external bonds and then you may strive to bind your heart to God because unification with God is preceded by detachment from matter.
Renunciation of the world is a gradual process which begins with the desire to attain contemplation of God. Renunciation includes a discipline of both the body and the mind. There is a correspondence between the degree of one's renunciation and one's ability to enter the contemplation of God. Blessed is the majesty of the Lord who opens the door before us, so that we may have no other wish save desire for him. For thus do we abandon all things, and our mind goes forth in quest of him alone, having no care which might hinder it from the contemplation of the Lord. The more the mind takes leave of care for the visible and is concerned with the hope of future things, my beloved brothers, the more it is refined and becomes translucent in prayer. And the more the body is freed from the bonds of worldly affairs, the more the mind is also freed from the same. Therefore the Lord gave us a commandment that before all else a man should hold fast to non-possessiveness and should withdraw from the turmoil of the world and release himself from the cares common to all men. He said, Whoever forsaketh not his entire human state and all that belongeth to him and renounceth not himself cannot be my disciple. This ideal of total renunciation of the world was embodied in practice in early eremitical monasticism. Because they wished to avoid the struggle arising from the proximity of worldly things, the ascetics of the past withdrew into the desert. As long as a man does not remove himself from what his heart dreads, his enemy always has a point of vantage against him. Because our ancient fathers who walked these paths knew fully well that our intellect is not at all times in vigorous health. They with wisdom considered the matter and clad themselves with non-possessiveness as a weapon. They have gone out into the desert where there is nothing which can be an occasion for passions. I mean they would have no occasion for anger, lust, the remembrance of wrongs and glory, and that both these and their like would be at a minimum by reason of the desert. For they walled themselves up in the desert as an impregnable tower. Thus each of them was able to finish his struggle in solitude, where the senses find no help for assisting our adversary through encounter with hurtful things. Monks flee the world, therefore, to avoid occasions of encountering the passions, sins, and sinful thoughts. But apart from this, there is an eremitical monasticism, a quest for renunciation of people, which in some cases leads a solitary to total rejection of any encounter with them. This flight too is undertaken for the sake of union with God. The solitary does not want any one to distract him from God. Isaac is very strong about the harm which may be done to a solitary through encounters with people. Oh, how evil is the sight of men and intercourse with them for solitaries. For just as the sudden blast of ice falleth on the buds of the fruit trees, nip and destroys them, so too contacts with men, even though they may be quite brief, and all appearances done to a good purpose. They wither the bloom of virtue, newly flowering due to the temperate air of stillness, which covers with softness and delicacy. The fruit tree of the soul planted beside the channels of the water of repentance. And just as the bitterness of the frost seizing upon new shoots consumes them, so too does conversation with men seize upon the root of a mind that has begun to sprout the tender blades of the virtues. And if the talk of those who have been controlling themselves in one particular thing, but who in another have minor faults, is apt to harm the soul, how much more will the chatter and sight of ignoramuses and fools? Speaking of the necessity of fleeing the world and people, Isaac often cites as examples the ancient ascetics. Arsenius the Great, who was especially dear to him, observed a commandment given to him by God. Arsenius, flee men and be saved. Once seeing a visitor approaching his desert, Arsenius ran away from him. Wait for me, father, the monk cried, because I am running after you for God's sake. And I, for God's sake, am fleeing you, Arsenius replied. On another occasion, Arsenius fell down before a monk who came to see him, declaring, I shall not get up until you have departed. When an archbishop came to ask him for spiritual instruction, he answered, Whenever you hear that Arsenius is found, do not draw nigh to that place. Being asked by Abba Macarius about his reason for avoiding people, Arsenius replied, God knows that I love you, but I cannot be with both God and men. The renunciation of people Isaac taught should be radical and absolute. Any bond of relationship, friendship or love shall be severed. The renunciation of relatives is a traditional theme in monastic literature. In developing it, Isaac refers to the example of a saintly monk who never visited his brother, also a monk, 
When the brother was about to die, he sent word to him, asking to come and bid him farewell. But the blessed man was not persuaded, not even at the hour when nature is wont to be compassionate to another man and to overstep the limit set by the will. He said, If I go out, my heart will not be pure before God. And his brother died and did not see him. This refusal may seem cruel by contemporary standards, but it shows the degree of renunciation required by monks in early monasticism. To achieve fullness in his life in God, a monk should be able to forget other people, to restrain himself from the care about them and from acts of mercy. If you wish to hold fast to stillness, become like a cherubim, who take no thought for anything of this life, and fix in your mind that no one else exists on this earth but you and God, whom ye heed, even as you have been taught by the fathers who live before you. Unless a monk hardens his heart and forcibly restrains his compassions so as to become distant from solitude from all other men, either for God's sake or for some material need, and he preserves only in prayer during the times which he has appointed, without having affection and concern for others entering his heart, he will be unable to attain freedom from turbulence and cares and to live in stillness. Through the point here is refraining from acts of mercy during times appointed for prayer, Isaac clearly considered the life of stillness higher than activity on behalf of people. He insisted upon the necessities of renouncing philanthropic activities, at least during certain periods of time.